remain standing as we pray for God to bless our tithes and offerings. Psalm 1, 1, 6, and verse 7. Return unto thy rest, O my soul, for the Lord hath dealt bountifully with thee. For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. I will walk before the Lord in the land of the living. So if you don't think you got much, if you're saved, he's dealt bountifully with you. And uh, we know that things wear out, they give out, they give up, they fail. Sometimes our knees, sometimes our engines. Um, but despite all of that, you know, even, even the wealthy people, they have health problems, they have car problems, they have money problems, they have stress that we don't have to have. Uh, but at the end of it all, <clears throat> thou hast delivered my soul from death mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling. And then I will walk before the Lord because of these things in the land of the living. So it's, it's been said before, you know, too bad God doesn't save us, rapture us as soon as we're saved. But then what kind of testimony is that in the land of the living? Right? How, how we put up with these things, how we get by is a sure testimony of God's goodness in our lives, more so than if, you know, we weren't here to talk about it. Let's thank him. Amen. Lord, we thank you this morning, Lord, for all that you've done for us. Lord, first of all, in dying on the cross and bringing us to you, Lord, giving us a gateway into heaven, Lord, where you said, you promised, where there will be no tears in heaven, Lord, that uh, we can have uh, peace eternally and life eternally with you, Lord. We thank you for providing that for us, Lord. We ask that you help us to stay focused, Lord, on supernatural things, on spiritual things, Lord, and not get so burdened down and focused on, on the horizontal. We ask, Lord, that we'd be uh, worthy of, of all uh, praise and acceptation in your eyes. We thank you for what you do for us, Lord. Pray that you bless this offering. Help us to use it wisely, Lord, as, as church leaders, and save uh, many souls in the area and the world beyond uh, through the power of your gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Visitors, please place your visitor card in the offering plate as it passes by. And then if you do not have a King James Bible with you, our ushers will come down after the offering and offer you one. And if you do not own one, uh, you can feel free to keep this as our gift to you. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. Praise God! Oh, I knew him and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath his cleansing blood. Amen. Thank you, Melody. This is a test of the emergency announcement system. If you heard me announce what we're doing immediately after this service, would you please raise your hand? All right. And what is happening right after this service? We're going to say again? That's right. Thank you, brother. Yes, we're having communion, Lord's Supper in the... 
for those who were not able to be with us, all right, thank you. Uh, we had a couple ushers that weren't sure actually had, had, had nailed that, and I want to make sure it got out. So uh, if, you, if you were s distracted, it, now you've definitely got it. So this has been a test of the emergency announcement system. If this had been an actual emergency, <laughs> the other day I was listening to one of our local radio stations, and uh, the whole thing with it was the test emergency broadcast system, and, and, you know, and then one minute of dead air. I thought, oh, great, they're really ready to, and for this one of the major stations in, in, in the Bay Area, one minute of dead air, and then this has been a test of the emergency broadcast system. <laughs> you know. Now, 24 hours later, I'm listening to the same station, and, and out of the blue came the, with no, no, nothing to preview it and nothing to say afterwards. I, this one I thought, well, th these guys are really foul ups. They're use, you know, these, are, these are sophomores, you know, who are running, interns, running, high school interns running this station. And uh, but I thought, just in case, I better be listening. But praise the Lord, the big one had not hit. So we're, we're fine. But thank you for helping me clarify. Just wanted to make sure that not only that I actually made the announcement, and, you know, because you get, you get to a certain stage where you, I think I did that. I, 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 feel, I feel like I did that. And uh, so I just want to make sure I really did do, I, I was here, you were here, it really happened. And then I uh, just want to make sure then that anyone didn't get it, man, they really got it now. So would you take your Bible and turn to 2 Timothy chapter 3? 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now you and I could very well be of completely different political persuasions, but can I say we can agree on one thing, this world is a mess, and it ain't getting any better. I, I just, I think about how just over a week ago, I was looking for some images for one of our publications, and I came across one that just stopped me dead in my tracks, because it was uh, a man, it apparently was in a Middle Eastern uh, setting, he's flat on his, on his stomach, he's, he, and, he, and on, on his back, is what looked like to perhaps could be a woman or a small man pinning him to the ground and has uh, his hair in their hand and holding his head back. And I thought, wow. You know, and so uh, I, I, I clicked on that image and that opened up another series of images. Next image is the person who had been on the back of the victim was holding the victim's head severed from the body by the hair. And that and alone is terrible that that has become somewhat routine in our modern world, that we're used to seeing and hearing about these horrible atrocities. But what really got me was the, the perpetrator, bad enough when it's a man, much worse when it's a woman. In this case, it was a little boy. Could easily have been a 10-year-old in our Sunday school who'd been trained to execute an enemy of Islam by this method of cutting the head. And can I say to you, that's not instantaneous death. That is torturous. I, I've, I've not yet, and nor do I, do I feel compelled to watch a video of such an, education, uh, such an execution. You're going back to Daniel Pearl, the Jewish uh, journalist who was captured by Al-Qaeda and was, had his head cut from his body several years ago, nor all the ones that have followed since. But uh, can I say to you that it's, it's not like the movies, you know, bang, bang, you're dead. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a horrible process. And the person lives through it for several minutes of agony before they finally succumb to death. But, but it's just illustrative that, you know, that just so shows us the times in which we live, that that's happening thousands of times multiplied by ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Boko Haram and uh, in Africa and, and other groups that, that are committing horrendous atrocities. While, while we in America sit idly by and, and enjoy our, our relative peace and prosperity, you know, and, and I, I can't help but wonder, so what was the fault of the man on the ground, the victim? Could he have been one of my brothers in Christ? Like those, I believe it was 18 uh, Orthodox, and I realize Orthodox and us have very different doctrinal positions. And I can only hope those men had their faith in Jesus Christ and were saved. But the ones who are marched out in orange jumpsuits uh, to a, a beach along the Mediterranean, 
and, and every one of them beheaded by uh, an ISIS fighter. I'll tell you, Islamic fighters are fierce, fierce, brave, courageous when they're up against unarmed men and captives and women and pilots in cages, you know, burned to death. And, and when they're up against uh, the handicapped and children, they are awesome fighters. Put them up against the U.S. Marines and see what happens. That's why they, have, they generally try to avoid those kind of conflicts. But I'm just simply saying that that, that, that's, that shows us the times in which we live, and they were foretold in the Bible. You know, you have to realize that going back a century ago, well, just prior to a century ago, because we're now in 2016, so take yourself back to about 1912, 19, 1913 and before, the 1880s and 90s, the the early years of the, the, the 20th century, the early 1900s, and Protestant Christianity was teaching that it was our job to bring in the millennium, to bring Jesus, to, in other words, we're to make the world safe for democracy, we are to make it a wonderful place to live, and then Jesus would come and take over his kingdom. So we were to, you know, we as Christians establish his kingdom, he would take over. Now, Bible-believing Christians realized that was fallacy. You know, we, we've understood that uh, you know, what, we're, what I'm about to teach you today, how the world's going to get worse and worse, and then at the end, you know, after a time of great tribulation, Jesus will come back and set up his kingdom. But, but it, all that was shattered with the onset of World War I. And, I. and I've read different figures, but I just recently read it was 38 million soldiers and sailors died fighting World War I, not including civilian casualties. It, it's her, it, it virtually wiped out a generation of the best and brightest for Germany and France and England. And uh, it, it was a tremendous travesty, but it just destroyed this notion. Because up till that time, in the Victorian age and the Edwardian age, it just seemed like the world was getting better and better. And we could, you know, bring in peace on earth, goodwill to men. We could bring in the millennium. But in order to have that view, you've got to go contrary to the scriptures. Because notice in 2 Timothy 3, verse number 1. Verse number 1 says, This know also, that in the last days, what can we expect? Perilous times shall come. You, you and I are going to be at peril. You say, well, I, I don't know. I, I've, well, well, yeah, let me, let me just state. There are certain places right now, you as an American citizen would not walk at 10 o'clock tonight. I mean, th places in the Bay Area, places in, in, in Sonoma County, places in Santa Rosa, you would prefer not to be alone late at night. All right? Uh, I think virtually everyone here now uh, has, you know, your vehicles locked down, and you have your, you have your, uh, your security system on, you've got your, may have your low jack in place, you've got your houses all shut down and locked, and you've got the, the security system on, and you're just hoping nothing happens while you're away. And, you know, that's, that's the nature of the times in which you live. Your great-grandparents knew nothing about that. Now, they just walk out of their home, leave it open. Neighbors knew they could come and go if they needed something at will, you know. And, and uh, cars didn't even have ignition, system, ignition keys. They just push a button. We've got to crank it and push the button, and, and off we go. And, uh, you know, but no need, no need to mess with the key. Uh, just, just amazing. I am, I am, I'll tell you one reason I'm looking forward to heaven. I can dump this load of PIN numbers and passwords out of my mind, and I no longer walk leaning to the right side held over by, by 12 pounds of keys, you know, like just walking like this, you know, pulled over by my, by my keys. Uh, man, I'll, it'll just, it'll be glorious not have to worry about security when the Lord has come back or when we're with him in heaven. Paul described to Timothy the Christian life and ministry as it needs to be engaged in these last days. Now, we know that perilous times shall come, but that does not give us an out. That doesn't mean, well, it's, it's, it, it's now hard to live for the Lord. So, therefore, we are exempt. Now, wait a minute. When's it ever been easy to live for Christ? Now, it's relatively easy in, a, in modern America, but it's getting harder. To take your stand now for Christ could cost you your promotion, could cost you your job, 
could cost you, uh, I, I, I imagine we're going to come to a day when someone will, someone will decide to discriminate against you because you're a, in, in renting a, a home to you because you are a clean and upright nuclear family. You know, in the past, that's what they looked for. They would discriminate against other odd configurations of human beings. Now you may be the one discriminated against because you're just too, like, normal. And I, it makes me uncomfortable. Some of us already know what it is to have relatives that treat us somewhat strangely just because we are what they used to be, but we haven't changed. And we're treated as weird as a result. And so what is, it, what is life to be for the Christian in these last days? Well, verse number 10 tells us. Drop me down, please, to verse 10. The Christian life in ministry as it needs to be even in perilous times. Verse 10, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. Now that which I just re read to you is a list of seven great blessings that come from being a Christian, from having Jesus as your Savior and living for him. Number one, there is doctrine. You may not think of doctrine as a great blessing, but beloved, it's wonderful to know what you are to believe. In an age when people uh, don't have a clue, it's just like, well, well whatever, whatever the current, however the current wind blows, I, I guess this now is okay, I guess that now is not okay, and, but you're constantly you know, checking media to make sure, am, am I front and center with, with where the society says I need to be. And, and, and as things shift increasingly over time. But it's great just to be, have a solid understanding. This is what I believe. No apology, no changing, no trying to please society or relatives or friends or neighbors or bosses or anybody else. This is what I believe. I have doctrine. I know my doctrine. Secondly, manner of life. It's a blessing to have before us a model of how we are to live. And then thirdly, there's purpose. Then it's great to have a purpose in life and not just simply being a consumer, a producer and a consumer. You go to work to, to be part of the overall production process in America, and then you go home to consume based upon whatever pay you've earned. And that's all you're good for, producing and consuming. You're either needed to help make things or you're wanted to help, help someone to help you spend your money. And that, that's all they care about. That's all you represent to them is a dollar sign. Whether the dollar sign is as a result of your labor on their behalf or spending the money that you've earned. It's great to have a purpose. This is why we strive. This is why we continue on even in perilous times because we have a purpose. Fourthly, it's great to have faith. It's good to know for whom we are striving. That, the, that we have a Savior who's worthy of our best. And we get up every day. It's not just a matter of producing and consuming. It's a matter of serving my Lord Jesus Christ. And I wonder what I'll get to do for him on this new day. Not just Sunday, but Monday through Saturday as well. My faith. And then fifthly, there's long-suffering. Again, you may not think of that as much of a blessing, but beloved, it's great to have from God the strength to help others live for Christ. Because if you enter into this thing of ministry, beloved, if you enter into this thing of trying to help teach and train and serve the body of Christ and our children and our teenagers and each other, you're going to need a big dose of long-suffering. Because we are not easy to get along with, all right? We can be obnoxious and cold, and we, we, can, we can use everything you've got and never think to say thank you. Now, we'll just take the best you have to offer. We'll drain you dry and, and then demand more. That's, that's, just, that's just, and that's the sinful part of us as human beings that won't be completely eradicated till we're, till we're with the Lord. So you're going to need a lot of long-suffering to be able to serve us because we may look good on the outside, but we've still got a lot of rough edges. And beloved, to be able to put up with us and get hurt 
and get uh, taken advantage of and to be a little bit abused from time to time, it's going to require long suffering. But that's a blessing we get through Jesus Christ that keeps us going even in perilous times. Sixth and verse 10, there's charity. That's the means to help others serve the Lord. Then it takes long suffering to have the strength to help others live for Christ, but it takes charity to, 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 which provides the means whereby you can help others to serve the Lord. Because charity means I give and I have no expectation of return. I give if I like you or I don't like you. Just for the sake of Christ, I'll, I'll continue to expend myself. And that's, that's the error of the modern Bibles automatically changing charity to love. Man, you know, it's easy for me to, to, to please those whom I, I genuinely love. But you know, when it comes to you, <laughs> who's pastor me? No, I'm just, I'm just saying when it comes to you, know, you, when it comes to any of us looking to certain other individuals, whomever they may be, it takes charity to continue to, to, to uh, pour yourself out on their behalf. And just, just that, can, that, that reservoir of, of love, if you will, but reservoir of charity that comes from Christ that enables us. And, it's, and it's, we do it for the other, for, for his sake. Not for me to get a feeling, not for me to be gratified, nor even to please the, the one for whom I'm doing this. So this, this is what raises it above other types of relationships. And by the way, even in your marriage sometimes it takes charity. Even in, with your children sometimes it takes charity. Is you just got to love on purpose. You just got to serve on purpose. And then seventh, it's a blessing that God gives us patience. Because we need the ability to serve the Lord ourselves. And, and we we got we to have patience in, in doing this because in perilous times, it, it becomes increasingly difficult. You're, you're, you're battling on so many different fronts. Man, physically, uh, br brother, brother Balser made mention about, you know, the knees giving out. Oh, my soul, how I do relate. And, uh, you know, and other things that just fail you over time, and yet, with patience, you continue serving the Lord and, and changing circumstances. And maybe you don't have the, the, the money you need to do the job the way you'd like to do it. Maybe you don't have the time you'd like to have, the energy you'd like to have, but nonetheless, or the help you'd like to have. But nonetheless, you just persevere with the patience that the Lord gives as a blessing. Now, with all that positive comes a counterbalancing negative. Because, beloved, you've got to expect there's going to be an opposition to hit you in spiritual warfare. Satan is not pleased. He's going to see to it that with all these blessings coming upon you, he's going to do something to try to ruin your day. Verse number 11. Paul says to Timothy, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch and Iconium at Lystra. Now, those are two negative factors with which all Christians must contend if you're going to serve him in perilous times. The first is persecutions. That's the outer pressures, the outside pressures on you. People trying to get you to quit serving the Lord. Whether, whatever their motive, sometimes this even comes down to jealousy. They're just envious that you're doing what they are not. And, and that does not please them. You'd think they'd be happy. You'd think they'd be delighted that you're serving the Lord, especially considering what you were before you got saved. <laughs> but sometimes they're annoyed. Oh, the, how many times my wife and I have seen the irony of someone wanting to see a boyfriend or girlfriend get saved or a husband or a wife get saved. And it's almost like they'll bring them to church until they get saved, and then it, but I don't want them to get too into this thing. I just want to know they're not going to go to hell. I don't, I don't want my, my boyfriend or girlfriend, my husband or my wife to go to hell. So I want them to get saved, but I don't want them to get too serious. I don't want them to be like, you know, like my dad or like my pastor or like, you know, one of these other nuts at the church. So as soon as I know he's saved, man, we're gonna, I'm going to start pulling them back. And sometimes how strange it is that 
someone who's just been praying, oh, God, help my husband to grow, help him to serve, you know, I want him to be the spiritual head of our home. And all of a sudden, he starts growing and taking off and asserting his authority. It's like, ah! This isn't how I dreamed it would be. And so there's outer pressures, persecutions, sometimes from the, most, from, from the strangest sources. And then secondly, there's afflictions. That's inner pressures. That, that's, that's things that just arise out of your life and make it more difficult to serve the Lord. Now, we learned that with the positive comes the negative, but we must also understand that with the negative comes more positive that God sends to offset the negative. So do you see it now? Uh, I'm, I have decided to follow Jesus. Hey, praise the Lord. I, get, I come into these seven wonderful blessings from serving the Lord. Satan, though, is stirred up. He's not happy. He's seeing me beginning to come into my potential. He wants to stop me cold. He sends persecutions and, up, and arising from within me come afflictions. Oh, man, I'm discouraged. Oh, man, I don't know if I want to keep doing this. The Lord says, hey, you hang in there. I'll send you some more blessing, some more positive to keep you going. And notice it please in verse 11. He continues and says, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. And that's how the Lord balances the Christian life. There's positive, but then the negative hits us. But before it can overwhelm us, if you will continue to do what God wants you to do, he'll send more positive to keep you going. Now, where people stall and quit is they're, they're, they're getting, they make the decision, I'm going to serve the Lord. Some positive things happen. They're encouraged. They're energized. They start going. Then they get hit with the negative persecutions and afflictions. Oh, man, I wasn't expecting this. Oh, I didn't know it was going to be hard. Oh, I quit. Before God can add to them the, 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 the additional blessings more positive to keep them going. Man, if you'll just keep pressing on, it, it, it turns into a pattern. I get blessings of God. I'm excited. I start going, bam, I get hit with persecutions. Oh, I've got afflictions. Oh, the Lord helps me continue on. I keep going. More blessings. Bam, I get persecutions. Oh, I get afflictions. But the Lord helps me continue on. And you, and you just keep going, 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 going. Until one day you hear from his mouth, well done, my good and faithful servant. Now, let's see the reality of living for Christ in this present world. It's in verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall do what? Suffer what? Persecute. You're going to suffer living for Christ. It's not a bed of roses. It's not all sugar, spice, and everything nice. Beloved, you're, you're going to get reaction. You're going to get kickback. The, the situation, I understand, is bad now in the world, but it's only going to become increasingly worse until Jesus returns. Verse 13, but evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. Each, each September, we have a uh, first responders appreciation day. We honor police officers and firefighters. And I've often thought about a message with verse 13 as the text, just to reassure them, gentlemen, ladies, you have job security. As bad as it is, it's only going to get worse. But you know, if you're not a Christian, that's a defeating thought. Only in Christ, with the overview of prophecy, knowing what's going to happen, knowing how all this thing has to play out, can we go, it's getting worse and worse. Hallelujah. Then everybody else says, it's getting worse and worse. I just want to, man, I feel like killing myself. I just, going away somewhere, hiding like a hermit on a mountain. I just want to get away from all this. Oh, I just can't stand anymore. Only we, by God's grace, are able to look at the situation and go, yeah, because we know that the Lord is coming back. But nonetheless, we've got to struggle through this deteriorating situation. Now, knowing these realities, how are we then to live? Verse 14. But, what well, the next two words? Oh, no, you don't understand. You, excuse me just a moment, please. 
persecutions, afflictions. Evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. All that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And you tell me I'm supposed to what in verse 14? Continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Nothing I just mentioned makes it proper or right or appropriate for me to quit on God. I've got to keep going. Continue thou. Don't quit on God. Don't waver on your beliefs and standards. Don't retreat from your commitments to the Lord. Continue thou. Now, if the new clock is to be believed, and I'm not so sure about that. I think Suzette moved it up about 10 minutes, but I'm not sure. Actually, th that was introduction. We're going to pray, but the balance of the message is not long. Trust me, beloved. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, do speak to our hearts now because we live in a country which we love, but also, Lord, which we recognize is suffering and rapidly deteriorating from its former glory in a world that's even worse off. Lord, for a short time, it looked like Europe was going to outshine America and all this, the talk of common market and the potential of the United States of Europe and all that that was discussed, Lord. Uh, and it seemed like they were entering into an, a golden age of prosperity and dominance of the world. But now we're seeing them suffering right along with us, Lord. There's no exemption. And, and, and for the developing world and the third world, the situation is so dire. And here we are, Lord, servants of Jesus Christ. And we need to know how you would have us to serve you, how we are to live under conditions that are going to make life ever more challenging, ever more difficult. So God, please help us to determine even now now, whatever happens, whatever natural calamity, whatever terrorist act, whatever, whatever war, whatever famine, whatever de economic depression, whatever happens, we're going to continue, Lord, to serve you and serve you well. And if life continues on pleasantly, we'll rejoice in that. But even then, we're not going to allow ourselves to be distracted from your service. Please help us, we ask now, as you teach us in Jesus' name. Amen. You're in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse number 14. Verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of. Now how are we to continue? Continue thou with everything I just outlined and everything I just discussed? <laughs> how? Well, that's a good question. And it deserves a, 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 an intelligent spiritual answer. And so, number one, I say to you, out of seven, seven thoughts, number one, learn the Bible from trusted sources. Learn the Bible from trusted sources. Verse 14 says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. Now, there's a lot of sources out there of spiritual information and knowledge. But you have, at your fingertips, you have right here in your backyard the most trustworthy source of biblical instruction. And that is your pastor and your church. The place where God led you. The place where many of you were saved. Many of you were baptized. The place you have chose to, chosen as your home church. This is the place. Beloved, the, the television preacher doesn't know you. And he has a message for, you know, just, just a kind of a generic message for whatever masses of people happen to be viewing or listening at that given moment. Here alone is the place where the Holy Spirit speaks to a man, not always me, whomever happens to be behind the pulpit for that service. The Holy Spirit has spoken to that man to give you a message where you live right now. And he's, now, I understand it is a diverse crowd. And the needs of a teenager and the needs of, an, of a senior saint and the needs of a, of a person who's well off financially and the needs of someone who's struggling even just to maintain housing or a car are vastly different. Someone who's well versus someone who's sick and, and so many different other scenarios of life that are played out in the lives represented in this room. 
But it's a but miraculously the Holy Spirit has a way of so working with the man of God that somehow your unique needs are addressed. If you're here and if you're listening, if you're heeding the message. But here is a trustworthy source, and you can learn the Bible. You can learn the Word of God. You can learn what God wants from you right here. Number two, read the Bible for yourself. Verse 16 says, all Scripture is given by what means? And all Scripture is also what? Profitable. It's given by inspiration of God, and it is profitable. We're not here just saying, oh, just, you know, you don't even really need a Bible. You just come and I'll tell you whatever you need to know. That's not what we're suggesting. What we're suggesting is you read the Bible at home, you study it for yourself, you come to church and let us supplement that. I'm not meant to be your only source of guidance and truth. You have the Holy Spirit within you. You are the priest of your own soul. You men are the heads of your households. You teach the Bible to yourself. You teach the Bible to your spouse. You teach the Bible to your children. And then you come in here and let me teach you the Bible. And we're all growing together. But read the Bible for yourself. Number three, learn Bible doctrine. Verse 16, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable to what end? For what? Doctrine. You've got to know what you believe and why you believe it. And your wife, gentlemen, and your children have every right to ask you why. Why, honey, do we believe this? Why, daddy, do we do things like this? And you need to have an answer. And if you don't have an answer, you come see me. And I'll explain it to you. And then you can take it back to your wife and explain it, and you can look like the fountainhead of all wisdom. I, I don't want her getting used to coming to me. I don't want your kids getting used to I, I really they come to you, sir. And in a single family situation with a single mom, I want them to come to you and let you be, I want them to have that tie in with you. So you, I'll be glad to help you understand that I want you to be the one to go home then and teach it to your loved ones. But you need to know what you believe, why you believe. You need to learn Bible doctrine. Number four, be open to reproof. Verse 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine for what else? Reproof. Reproof is being told you are wrong. And right there poof, is the dividing line between pastor and so many people. They just cannot handle anyone daring to suggest they may just happen to be wrong in a given matter. But beloved, you've got to be open to reproof. There are infinite blessings that come from reproof. It, you, ought to, you need to count it a blessing that someone's looking out for your blind spots. And by the way, that's a two-way street. I ask my, our church leaders and my wife and my daughters, as, as a daughter, Tricia, who is at home with me, I want their input. I want to know. You know, what it is that they see in me that's, that's, that's contrary or wrong or, or, or uh, you know, counterproductive uh, in my life. I want to know. Now, you may think I've used this pulpit to beat up on somebody, but I have no conscious thought of ever using the pulpit to beat up on someone who dared to tell me I was wrong in something or, or suggested an alternative. Quite to the contrary, I've made some huge changes in things I wanted to do because someone came to me and challenged me on something and, and I thought, well, that, 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 that could be legitimate. And I made changes. Sometimes it's, it's been publicly acknowledged and sometimes you're just quietly done. But I, I, I work on being open to reproof, not just from the Holy Spirit, but from you as well and from my family. And beloved, you have got to work on being open to reproof, being told you are wrong. Number five, allow yourself to be corrected. Verse 16 says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, and for what? Correction. Correction is being told how to do something right. Man, why do we get offended because somebody suggests a better way? And you know a suggestion is not necessarily something you have to 
feel compelled. So, so why fight a suggestion? Why not just smile? If you feel the person's out to lunch and totally wrong, just smile and say, thank you. I'll, I'll pray about that. Man, thanks for caring enough to make a suggestion. I appreciate that. In your mind, you're like, <laughs> no way. That's the stupidest thing I've ever heard in my life. That will not work in my, my situation. But you don't have to sit there and have a verbal battle over nonsensical non-issues. Just receive it in the spirit in which it's given. And if you are convinced that's not what God wants for you, fine. But how about if it is what God wants? What if you can, you can be humble enough to go, oh, gee, that is smarter. Hmm, I guess we should do it that way. And it doesn't make me less of a man because I took a suggestion from my wife or my daughter or a lady in the church or another man in the church or a teenager. You know, if they have a good idea, I'm the fool if I'm too proud to implement it because I can't afford to let them think that I am less than this lofty office position. You know, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I'm the end all and know all. No, I'm an idiot. If that's, what I, if that's how I want to project myself. I'm much better off graciously receiving the suggestions, acting on those that I believe are of God, and then maybe even once in a while going back and say, hey, you know what? Thank you for that. That, was, that, was, that helped me. Number six, never stop learning spiritual truth. You'll never outgrow the word of God. Verse 16, all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable for doctrine, for, for reproof, for correction, for, what's the next three words? Yeah. The Lord wants to teach you what's right. Can I say, in every sphere of life. That's why I give out articles for ladies and say, guys, let's read these. That's why I give out stuff on marriage, say, singles, you need to read this. That's why I give out instruction on parenting and say, hey, this is good for all of us. I, I, is there any area of biblical knowledge and understanding and interpersonal relationships we really think we're exempt from? Man, I want to I know to the best of my ability, you know, what, what a woman needs, because I minister to women, most important of all, my wife. So I want to know. I want to know how I can pray for her and how I can support her and how I can help her come into the fullness of her potential. That's why when I give out something for men, I hope she reads it. Not so that she'll sit back and go, good night, is, is he a piece of work? Man, he's not anywhere near this ideal. Man, what a hypocrite. Here he is trying to tell the guys of the church how to live, and he ain't doing this. Not to look at it judgmentally, but to say, <laughs> he's, there's a gap here between what he's trying to get his men to understand and where he is. I need to pray we can close that gap. And she and I can both tell you remarkable prayer requests God has answered in our, in our relationship with each other, things that I thought, there's no way Laura Miracles are going to change this. But for Lauren Hope, if I can use this in a Baptist church, Hail Mary pass. I'm going to throw it up to heaven and just keep praying about it for a while. And lo and behold, I see the changes. And she could even give you more dramatic, because I'm the one that he, needs much more work. Things she's watched change in me, not as a result of beating me over the head with the Bible or burning my supper or making me sleep on the couch or, you know, giving me the silent treatment or, just simply loving me, caring for me, but behind the scenes, praying for me. And the changes, dramatic in many cases, happen. Number seven, so never stop learning spiritual truths. Number seven, continue growing in your capacity to serve the Lord while remaining busy in the Lord's service. Because, beloved, there's always a way to do it better. So let's stay busy, but always look for ways to improve our, our service for Christ. Verse 16, let me race through verse 16 as we head into verse 17. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction, and for correction, for instruction of righteousness. That, verse 17, the man of God may be what? That deals with maturity. See, uh, 
the ability to reproduce oneself is maturity. Uh, I, I am not a perfect man in the sense of sinless and without fault, but I am a perfect man. I'm fully functioning. I have the capacity of reproducing myself. In the spiritual realm, I'm not sinlessly perfect either, but I do have the capacity to reproduce myself and see other souls saved. From me, I can help them come to Christ. Perfect in the sense of mature and, and, and improving myself and, and, and becoming more of what the ideal that God has for me. But notice in verse 17, it continues, may be perfect, the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all what? Good works. God wants me busy. I only have a short span of time. It is rapidly evaporating. I've got to be busy in the, serving the Lord. Because this is my chance to show him the sincerity of my love. When I'm in heaven, like, what's the big deal about praising Jesus when he's right there? And I'm in the midst of the glories of heaven. And there is no souls to save. And there's nobody to minister to, no one to teach. And just, just like, I know God will keep us busy for eternity. And I, he's got some exciting things in mind for us. But only now do I have a chance to change people's destinies. Only now do I have a chance to show the Lord how truly I love him. Because now, it's hard. There, it's natural. In this wicked age, you must decide to serve the Lord on purpose. But continue thou in the things which thou hast heard and hast been assured of. Number one, continue to learn the Bible at church. Number two, continue to read the Bible for yourself. Number three, continue to learn Bible doctrine. Number four, continue to respond properly to reproof. Number five, continue to allow yourself to be corrected. Number seven, continue to learn spiritual truths. That's number six. Number seven, continue growing in your capacity to serve the Lord while remaining busy in the Lord's service. Beloved, if you're here this morning and do not yet have Jesus as your Savior, in just a moment, we're going to have a time of invitation, and our heads will be bowed and our heads will be closed, and I will give you an opportunity to say, you know, if you're, if you're here today not sure that you're going to heaven, let us, let us help you with that. Please, please come to me right away as the pastor. Pastor, I need to be saved. And we'll have someone take a Bible and show you how you can know for sure your sins are forgiven and you have a home in heaven. Not through our church, not even through your own efforts, but through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And if you're here this morning and you've already been saved, you're, you're, you're trying to serve the Lord in a wicked age, and it's a struggle. Something I said this morning, and I doubt for, some, for many of you, anything this morning was new, but it was needed. And perhaps you need to get, say, you know what, I, I, I've been coming short on this aspect of my Christian life. And for a few moments, this simple platform becomes for us an altar where we kneel, or if I'm unable to kneel, we stand and speak to the Lord about something he talked to us about in the sermon. Or perhaps something completely unrelated. I, I don't know who's got a crisis in their life right now. I don't know who it is that desperately needs something from, from the Lord. That you may want to come and just, that may be the thing you want to talk to God about for the next few moments. But while we sing the song of invitation, if you need Christ as Savior, you come to me. If you need simply talk to your Lord, you feel free to come and do that as well. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for speaking to us this morning and helping us, Lord, to, in some cases, learn what's expected of us. In other cases, reaffirm those expectations and realize that we're coming short on one or more and need to close that gap. And I pray, God, for some solid decisions for you, for you today. You are worthy. May we be much more what you desire us to be. We thank you in Jesus' name. As we stand together, please, beloved, I'm right here at the front. If you need Christ as your Savior, please come right to me. If you need baptism, some other spiritual need I can help with, or if you simply want to come and kneel and speak to your Lord, you feel free to come. As we sing number 542, Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, 542. You're hearing hymn number 542.
is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Join me on the first verse as we sing 542. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take him at his word, just to rest upon his promise, just to know the saith the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Oh, how sweet to trust in Jesus, just to trust his cleansing blood, just in simple faith to plunge beneath the cooling, cleansing flood. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, tis sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self to cease, just from Jesus simply take life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I've proved him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. I'm so glad I learned to trust him, precious Jesus, Savior, friend, and I know. Thank you, brother. Um, hey, there seems to be some kind of a cultural event happening this afternoon I've, I've, I've caught wind of. And uh, so I encourage you to be in church at 6 o'clock. And I uh, really, really want to ask you to put that uh, in at the top of your party list. Um, I got a text from Sister Doris Miller. So remember her? She was a nurse that lived out here and was part of our church for a couple years. And uh, she lives in Colorado. And she said on February 1st, that was Monday, take care of our Broncos out there. I thought, That's a strange request. I said to her, are they in the Super Bowl? I had, I had no clue. And she said, yes, probably Manning's last game as a player. And uh, so I, I responded, if he or other Broncos are in church on Sunday, I promise we'll take good care of them. And <laughs> so and she thought I should know. Uh, the game is Sunday. <laughs> okay, well, does that mean he may be otherwise occupied? Uh, so anyway, uh, <laughs> that shows where I am on sports. I just, I, I, I'm, man, I'm into the big leagues far beyond, you know, guys chasing a piece of big skin up and down a muddy field and trying to kill each other. Uh, man, I just, uh, I, I, there's something bigger I'm playing for than a ring and a few million dollars. Uh, it's, uh, it's, we're, we're in the big leagues here. And, and so, I just want to encourage you, 6 o'clock, we're continuing on the evening service. Hope you'll be here. Amen. Who's Brother David Hamblin. Broncos are going to be beating the Panthers so bad by 6 o'clock. You guys don't need to watch the end of the game anyway. Here we go. I am, I am glad to see a lot, of, uh, a lot of orange and blue out there. Marcy, good job. Brother Frank. Brother Hanson. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we do thank you for the preaching of your word, Lord. We thank you for uh, a preacher that's not afraid to stand on the word of uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would uh, help us to remember to uh, continue, Lord, to continue in studying your word, continue to grow 
Lord, uh, to uh, cease from the sin and strife. Lord, and we thank you for that. Uh, we do thank you for uh, the way that you care for us. <coughs> Lord, we do pray that nobody would be seriously injured this afternoon in the game. Pray that, uh, Lord, for those Christian players that are there, that you would be glorified through their testimony. And we thank you for that. Bring us all back safely at 6 o'clock tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You are dismissed.